Good morning, and thank you all for joining today's Science, Conservation, and Humanities Lecture presented by the New York Botanical Garden. My name is Charles Zimmerman, and it is my pleasure to welcome you from locations across the United States and around the world to today's webinar, Plant Diversity in Brazil, Studying Sedge Evolution in the Atlantic Coastal Forest. At any time during today's event, please feel welcome to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window, and our hosts will raise these for our speaker to answer at the end. Live captions can be enabled by clicking the CC button and then show subtitles or view full transcript. This event is being recorded and it will be shared on the NYBG Lecture Library. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Douglas Daly, Krukoff Curator of Amazonian Botany and Director of the Institute of Systematic Botany at the New York Botanical Garden, who will introduce today's speaker, Dr. Waite Thomas. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being part of this. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Wade Thomas. Wade began his botanical career at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he graduated with a BS in botany in 1973. Subsequently, at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, he completed a master's degree in 1976 and his PhD in 1982. The subject of his doctoral thesis under the supervision of Warren H. Wagner was the systematics of Rhynchospora section Dichromina cyperaceae. He is now a curator emeritus and his presentation is part of a series of seminars by our new curators emeritus. During a botanical career that has spanned more than 35 years, almost all that time based at the New York Botanical Garden, Wade Thomas has participated in over 100 field expeditions and published almost 200 scientific works, including two edited books. He's advised or co-advised 15 doctoral students and became one of the world authorities on the systematics of the Cyperaceae. His research programs set down roots in Brazil where his work led to major advances in our knowledge of the flora of the Atlantic coastal forests and had significant impacts on conservation in that region. He has held leadership positions in the Organization for Flora Neotropica and the Species Plantarum Project. He's made perhaps his greatest contribution in forging productive international scientific collaborations and in mentoring young scientists who are becoming leaders of the botanical community and who attest to his pivotal impacts on their professional lives. His seminar today is entitled, Plant Diversity in Brazil, Studying Sedge Evolution at the Atlantic Coastal Forest. Please welcome Wade Thomas. Hi, everybody. Um, I appreciate, thank you all for being here. And I will move right on to the slides in my PowerPoint. And um, <clears throat> since I'm going to be talking about both the Atlantic forest and sedges, particularly as, as they relate to Brazil, I want to start first with a map of Brazil. Show everybody who's not Brazilian what Brazil is like. First of all, Brazil is huge. It's the size of the United States. So um, you have to keep that in mind when you think about working in Brazil. You can't just get in the car and go somewhere. If we go from the AC way over here in the West, and we were to put it on Google Maps to get us to drive all the way to PB in the farthest east part of Brazil. That's 3,300 miles or 54,000 kilometers. In other words, it's the same distance as if you were to go to Google Maps from Miami, Florida in the southeast of the US to Seattle, Washington in the far northwest. <clears throat> it's a big place. Now, sedges are really diverse in Brazil because Brazil has lots of different kinds of savannas. In the north, bordering the Guianas in Venezuela, <clears throat> in northern Amazonia, the Guiana Highlands, and they have a whole group of sedges that occur only there. They're very different and very interesting. The whole center of Brazil, the heart of Brazil, is made up of what is called the Cerrado, or the, the mega diverse savanna, within which you find these high elevation areas that, uh, that uh, 
occur over a thousand meters called the Kamparu Pestre, or the Rocky Meadows, which are high savannas, which have their own flora. Lots of species that only occur there. And then in the far south of Brazil, we have the Pampas, which are sort of big grasslands or plains, which could, are savannas also in the, in the far south that extend in Uruguay and Argentina. So, oh, and, and first of all, later in the talk, I'm going to be talking about the Atlantic coastal forest, the, the other forest in Brazil, not the Amazon. This is a separate forest that occurs along the, the whole coast of Brazil. And the northern part of it is more lowland and tropical and is the part I'll be talking about later. So we'll get back to that in a bit. Now, why sedges? Um, the family Cyperaceae are found everywhere from the Arctic to the Amazon, and uh, they're one of the world's dominant plant families. In fact, I'd argue that they're one of the ecologically most important families in the world behind grasses and perhaps legumes, but uh, they occur everywhere and they can be extremely important, particularly in, in wetland areas. They look like grasses, they have triangular stems often. They're usually not of direct economic importance unless you like water chestnuts and uh, make paper out of papyrus, but ecologically they're very important. Now why ring cosper? Why the beak sedges? Uh, I became interested in these doing a project as an undergraduate where I had to understand the flora of the southeast coastal plain savannas in North Carolina. And I had to collect these little little grassy things that all looked alike. But when I opened them up, un opened up the, the inflorescences and found these seeds inside, they were all different. I became fascinated with them. And uh, I'm also really interested in why uh, plant species occurs and grows in one place and, uh, and not another. And ring cosper species can be extremely can be extremely specific and, and very habitat specific with pH requirements, wet season and dry season, sun and shade and temperature. And we also can see here that they also can vary greatly in size. We see here uh, Rincospera albescens, so it's three and a half centimeters tall, and then Rincospera splendens are three and a half meters tall. And, but most commonly, they're found in savannas, like the savanna here in, in uh, central Bahia, where I'm collecting a new species of Rincospera. And the habitat requirements can be different. While, while many of them, most species are like open areas, savannas that are wet part of the year and dry part of the year, Rincospera splendens is a forest species or forest edge species, and Rincospera albescens is sold in Europe as an aquarium plant. It's in nature, it is often underwater for half the year. Now, one of the really cool things about Rincospera is how, how varied the inflorescences are. And this is, has caused uh, people who worked on the, on the um, group in the past to divide it into many genera. In fact, one very a brilliant sedge um, researcher who worked on the group for the Flora Brazil a century ago split it up into eight genera and he had a certain reason because they all look different. But um, we can see that on the on the on the left here, Recospertenia flora has this repeated series of panicles going up the stem. And then Recospera macrostachy in the middle has these open ends for lessons with every spikelet separated from each other. Where others like Rincospera splendens again has these, all the spikelets grouped in the head. And a very common uh, form is, re, is what we see in Rincospera capitolata where they form these fascicles of spikelets. Now, what is a spikelet, since I've been mentioning that? Spikelet is how the flowers are arranged there, and it's a, essentially a small spike where each flower is sessile on an axis and, so, and sub, subtended by a, a small scale, like we see the FB, this 
in the uh, drawing of a flower in the, cent in the center here. And these all are arranged together in, in a spike, spikelet, we see in this ring house for Capitalasia. And uh, the flowers emerge from the top. Often one day the stamens will come out and, and be exposed. And the next day the stigma will come out and be exposed to so the same flower, flowers on more than one day. <clears throat> now once the flowers are fertilized, the, the seeds develop, these nutlets, and they these are this is one of this is one of the things that got me so, so fascinated with the group because um, they vary so much. Here we see Rincosper plumosa with these these uh, perianth parts that have become bristles in their plumose in Rincospora plumosa. In Rincospora alba, the type species for the genus, they are, they have sort of multiplied instead of being six, there are, there are many of them and they have become these very narrow bristles with these backward pointing serrations. In many species, the bristles are gone completely as in Rincospora becleriana. And here we, uh, we have also an inkling of the difference we see in the achenes. <clears throat> the surface of the king can vary from smooth to rugose uh, to other sh shapes and sizes we'll see. And the top of, the, of the, the fruit, this persistent style base can also vary a lot. It can be triangular or very long and narrow. And what I'm gonna show you now are four plates that were published in when I uh, monographed Green Cosper for the flora of Mesoamerica. And it shows you, and these are all four done to the same scale. So you get an idea of size and shape and variety. <clears throat> and here's one series of, of five, and we can see the long, narrow style base and the textures of the Akeen here uh, and the bristles that some have and others have uh, much less. But here's a very a wild one, Rincospora rugosa, and here Rincospora barbata with these wings that come off the side and these very tiny ones up here. And then Rincospora diadon with these spectacular plumose bristles and this very different shape of the Akeen and, and, the, uh, and the style base. And the biggest ones of all, uh, the Rincosper Corombosa group with these enormous um, style bases at the top. And these, um, so the whole point of this is the, the, the style, the fruits are extremely important for identification in these, both, both at the species level and often to characterize the groups. In terms of characterizing the groups, um, we have worked out <coughs> a preliminary uh, phylogeny that was done using RADSeq, which is <coughs> a rest restriction site associated DNA sequencing, using a percentage of the whole genome, so usually uh, from 1 to 10 percent. And each block here represents uh, a group that has been studied. If, if the block is colored in, it's been studied. If it's an open block, it's, it's still open, open for business. Um, also, the, when we did this, this phylogeny, we were, we were interested in certain groups. I have, I'm interested in this green group that I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, a student of mine was interested in this blue group, Pedro. Another student of mine, Felipe, is interested in this yellow group. So we put lots of samples in for those groups. Uh, the biggest group in terms of species diversity is probably the, the red group, the typical uh, section ring cosper group. And um, so what I want to, want to do now is give you a little, little taste of these different groups. <coughs> Uh, and um, so what I'm going to do is go, we'll go through this. And uh, this is a typical ring cospera. And 
this was probably the first group that was revised to a student at Harvard did a rev did an excellent revision for the species that occurred in the southern US where this is extremely diverse and the West Indies and uh, did an excellent job. It was later studied by Rosa Guaglianone in, in South America and I worked on it hard for uh, Flora Mesoamerica and it was revised by Bob Crowell for, for North America and my former student, Chris Buddenhagen, uh, did a, an extensive phylogeny of the group, and that has appeared in his thesis and needs to be published. But uh, the, the group is what we, uh, us that live in the U.S., a typical think of, typically think of during Cosper with these brown spikelets, brown scales, and these fascicles. However, a couple of, of groups have decided to have white spikelet scales. Here's a typical akeen with bristles coming up from underneath. And uh, it is a fairly basal group. And this is interesting because there are some old world species. Now moving on from that, <clears throat> as, as Doug mentioned, uh, this is the group that I studied for my PhD thesis, and it was published in 1984. And, and this is a com completely different group. All the, all the species, instead of having fascicles, all the, the, all the spikers are grouped in heads. So, and many of, this, of, the, of the species, maybe all of the species have either white spikelets or white involucral bracts subtending the head, as you can see in this large ring cosper latifolia. And, um, <clears throat> and so this, is, this, this was a very interesting uh, for me. And because they were white, I uh, had these very attractive species. I spent a lot of time looking at insects visiting the flower heads. And um, so I was able to observe insect visitation, collect insects, make a list of visitors to many, to five or six species, but I couldn't do any more than that. A little later with Bob Kral, he and I worked on the, another group called Silicaria, which comes out right next to this to Dichromina. And uh, in fact, if you look at the seeds of the two groups, they're identical. The fruits are identical. Uh, you can't distinguish them. The only thing that's different in these two groups is that one has a very open inflorescence of panicles, and the other has capitate inflorescences. And that determines basically whether they're have insects visit them or not. Now, <clears throat> uh, later on, as I show these other groups, I'm going to show a picture of who worked on those groups. So I show a picture of who worked on this group way back then. So that's, that's me back when I had hair. Um, Recosper section tenues is one of the groups that we sampled a lot of in this, in this phylogeny. And uh, this was studied really well by uh, Pedro Joel. And uh, these are really interesting. The species are nondescript, frankly, as, as at the plant level. They all kind of look like this Rincospor emaciata with separate brown spikelets. Sometimes it can be very small plants. They're never too big. <clears throat> and they don't have any bristles. So you might say, uh, but, but Pedro did a really careful job and he revised, recognized 24 species. It has about that many that remain to be described. And what, what you have to do, the secret, is to look carefully at the fruits because the fruits are incredible in this group. Uh, this is a selection of fruits at more or less the same size uh, from, from the group he studied. So you've got all these different 
sizes and shapes and colors and smooth ones with bow ties underneath and these big rugos ones and uh, sunken style bases. So they're, they're, they're fascinating. And if you're careful and you look carefully, you can find a whole lot uh, of differences and these, they hold up, you know? If you say, well, these, if you pick these two in the middle here, ah, oh, they look a lot alike, but the seeds are different. Well, it's just a variation, but they grow in different places. They grow in different habitats. It all, it all adds up and, the, and you just have to be very careful. Now the opposite of these small plants with these very delicate akines was studied by my another student of mine, Felipe Weber, <clears throat> worked on the large, robust Rhinchospora section long longirostres. These are big plants, usually one to two meters tall, and the 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 fruits are are amazing too. These uh, Rhinchospora inundata here has this this um, so it must be fifteen millimeters long that uh, fruit, the style base and everything. Most of them are shorter and stouter than that. <clears throat> but they always have brown spikelets there um, um, found in the New World and Old World. It's also a basal group. And, uh, and it's, got, it's, it's got a lot of problems with maybe introgression, but very closely related species. <clears throat> now I'm going to, uh, the next group, section Pluriflori is, is completely different also. It's was studied by my uh, former student, Anna Claudia. And just like Dichromina, this group was complete, it was all capitate, all these heads, and many of them are the, some of the most conspicuous species in, in, uh, in all the Cyperaceae, certainly, uh, such as the Rincosa speciosa, which uh, I should have put a slide in it. I've got a, a picture of me holding a, a Christmas decoration, which is a meter tall Christmas tree just made out of, of dried inflorescences of, of Rhinchospora speciosa. Uh, many species uh, don't have the large white involucral bracts, have the green involucral bracts, but the spikelets are brighter colored than you would, than would be normal, like Rhinchospora diamantina. Uh, and these, the fruits often have bristles that may or may not be, be be plumos underneath. They tend to be smooth. And these, this group is really interesting. It, it, uh, almost all of them occur in central Brazil. They're in the Cerrado and the Campo Rupestre. They may spread out a little bit, a little farther south, a little farther north. But they're all located there. <clears throat> and uh, when I was doing my work on Rincosro section dichromina, I got one spec specimen from Mexico that was immature. So I didn't have the fruits to look at because the fruits of dichromina don't have any bristles. They're very different than this. And I saw this thing with white involucral bracts. It looked a little weird, but well, it looks like one that occurs in the West Indies, maybe it got into Mexico. So that's the way it is in my thesis. When I got to herbarium in Mexico City and looked at mature specimens collected from that region, a fruit like this one fell out and it was a complete eye opener for me and, and it showed that, that there's one, one disjunct species that goes from the Cerrado to southern Mexico, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and there's another different species that occurs in Cuba. So except for central Brazil, those are the two outliers. <clears throat> and um, so there's a lot we have to learn about why species occur where they do. I'm going to go back now to 
this central green group that was also sampled a lot in the phylogeny, this section pleurostache is that up until recently uh, had been maintained as a separate genus. But after doing the phylogenetic work and showing that it's buried in the middle of Rinkosberg, we, we couldn't uh, maintain it like that. So um, as we saw earlier, we saw in another slide of, of uh, repeated inflorescences of Rinkosberg tenua floris. The first dakies is has lots of repeated inflorescences along a long, long column. And um, unlike the other species, all virtually all the other groups occur in open areas or are most common in open areas, but pleurostachys is found only in forests. And most species are found only in the Atlantic forests of Brazil. So um, this has been really interesting, both from studying the point of ring cosper, but also because, as we'll see later, I've done a lot, whole lot of work studying the flora of the Atlantic forest. So I'm really interested in how this species fits into the flora there. <clears throat> and one thing that that I notice is when I'm looking for this species, you never find it in a disturbed forest. It's always in an intact forest. And I wonder why that is. And I think, and I think this may be true for many species, the herbs we see in these tropical forests is I think they grow really slowly and it take a long time to recover from, from disturbance. And uh, so, if you disturb an area, it's going to take probably 20 years before these plants start coming back, before we start noticing that they're there. Um, the interesting features about this group are that the spikelet scales are normally spiral in Rinkosper, but here, until the, the fruit starts to develop, you see the scales are disicus. And the, br and the bristles have this really interesting plumosness. They're not big feathery plumos at the base, but they have hairs that go all the way up along the whole length of the, of the bristle. And this is common to virtually all the species in Pleurostaches. <clears throat> There's one clade here that are species that occur and seem to be mostly occur in drier forests and another clade that occur in moister forests that, that never have a dry period. <clears throat> now, why, why do we have all these different kinds of, of inflorescences and very, this variation in this group? <clears throat> and this is one of the, one of the, um, the great coincidences for me is I mentioned when I was working on dichromene, I was collecting insects. And one of my regrets is, well, I'm, I, I have this systematic thesis I've got to finish. So I can't sit down here and, and spend three weeks in one place and do controlled experiments to prove that these critters are indeed insect pollinated. <clears throat> and then I started working in Northeast Brazil and got to know professors at the Federal University of Pernambuco. And one of them was a pollination biologist. And she had a student who had worked on Rinkosper ciliata, the common weedy species found throughout tropical America. And uh, then the student, Anna Carolina here, wanted to work on the group again for her PhD thesis. And, and then Isabel, her advisor said, Oh, I know this guy who studies sedges, let's talk to him. Little did they know that when I published my monograph of section dichromina, I have a whole chapter there on insect pollination in dichromina, which is buried in the middle of the monograph and no one knew about. So I scanned it all and sent it to them. And uh, it was perfect because I could help uh, Carol choose which species to study so that she could have a 
white bracket species, a less conspicuous species. We'll get some inconspicuous species, and she can study a whole a whole sequence of <clears throat> of pollination. And this is the kinds of things she used. And you see this white bag here. She would put that over some plants in a population, and that would exclude everything, wind and insects from pollinating uh, the inflorescence enclosed. That means that that inflorescence, either it produced, if it were outcrossing, it produced nothing. If it could self, it would have some seed production. In some other plants in the population, <clears throat> she would put a mesh bag on and that would let some wind go through, but would exclude insects. So, <clears throat> and then in another the rest of the population it was control it had nothing going, nothing, no, nothing attached to it. Uh, so that would be the the standard control plant. So comparing the three groups, she could see how much, what percent of the plants were self, and if you permitted wind pollination, how much more. How much, what percentage more would be pollinated by wind? And then if you looked at the control group, you could see how much more insects added to it. And she could determine if the plant were insect pollinated, wind pollinated, or pollinated by both under different circumstances. So it was fascinating. I and mean, she, she's done an amazing job. <clears throat> and um, uh, so, that's always gotten me thinking about what, how the inflorescences vary across this whole group here. We see the standard look of the inflorescence in a typical ring copper way over on the left with these fascicles of brown spikelets. But every now and then you get a species that has white, as we'll see. Silicaria, inconspicuous, section dichromina, Conspicuous section tenues, inconspicuous. <clears throat> Some species in this uh, group that's not monographed that includes the paniculati um, are clearly inconspicuous. Silicaria, when the spikelets mature, they're inconspicuous. The same as section long longirostris and Conspicuous spikelets or conspicuous inflorescences in section pluriflory. Uh, and then <clears throat> when we look at, let's go for the most uh, outrageous, all the, all the groups <clears throat> in which white interleucral bracts have evolved and evolved Separately, it evolved at least three times in Rincospora section dichromene, as we see here in this green with these arrows here. Um, I don't have slides of all the different ones, but these two here with these red arrows, if you look on the phylogeny, what they're, they're weirdos that have sort of slipped between uh, big groups. This Rincospora duchii is this very strange uh, ring crossword that looks like a bromeliad. It's about it's about uh, eight to ten centimeters high, and it's on the ground, and uh, it's all related to itself so far. We have to figure out what it really where it really belonged. In any case, it's a separate evolution of white bracts. The ring crossword speciosa and consanguinea and albiceps all occur in in section pluriflory. And there are no, and here this uh, Rincospora, uh, <clears throat> there's another Rincospora here that has white bracts sometimes. Uh, so we'll see if that, if that holds. But what about if we look at groups that have something conspicuous about the spikelet or the flower that cause it to be uh, perhaps pollinated, visited by insects. So we'll look at, <clears throat> here we'll see that this 
is much more widespread. Uh, even in, in section Rhynchospora, where most species have brown spikelets, there are a couple of species, Rhynchospora alba for one, which have white spikelets. Rhynchospora albida in this blue box, the spikelets are white when in flower. Uh, species of section Dichromina, many species have white spikelets, even if they don't have white influence involucral bracts. And even one silicaria where they're mostly all brown, there's, there are two species which have white spikelets, Rhinchospora canada and Rhinchospora ebernia. <coughs> In this red box here we see, which was is group, the paniculati group that hasn't been monographed, whereas most of the species that have brown spikelets, Rhinchospora polyphylla, when in flower, the spikelets are white. Who knows? Rhinchospora cephalotes is one that was studied very carefully by Anna Carolina. And she showed that even the, the spikelets are kind of greenish, pale greenish. The way the stigmas and the uh, stamens stick out from the inflorescence makes the whole look very pale and uh, potentially attractive. The other really cool thing about Cephalodes is it has fragrance. And um, <clears throat> this is something, the, the, uh, the, there are many species that have fragrance that Anna, Anna, that Anna Carolina has studied. And they occur in, in, many, in different groups throughout the phylogeny. <clears throat> Rhinchospora pallida, again, white spikelets when in flower. Now, the Pleurostachys group, remember, this is the group that occurs only in forests. So what's it? No, if they're in the forest, there's not much wind, but they were brown looking spikelets. But when they're in flower, the spikelet scales and these stigmas and stamens give the look of a plant that's, that's a little more conspicuous. So it's quite likely that these species are visited by insects, at least in part. It may be uh, what uh, Anna Caroline would call ambophilus. They're both wind pollinated and insect pollinated. <clears throat> the other group that has lots of uh, conspicuous capitate species again are the Syrincospora globosa and diamantina in the a pleuroflory group. And there's one species uh, by flora in this uh, outlier group to the side here that has pale spikelets also. So it's quite possible that these are <coughs> um, visited by insects. We need a lot more work. Now, we're going to get back to uh, the Pleuroflora group because I want to go on to the Atlantic forest. And um, I'm changing gears now. This is another of research that I've, that I've been fascinated in. In addition to studying Rhinchospora, I've been fascinated on the, the flora of this region and uh, why, it, why it's so diverse here. The Atlantic forest is one of the world's uh, critical, critically endangered ecosystems, let's say. Um, this fringe of forest where much of Brazil's population lives, so therefore it's under huge pressure for, for to be cleared for farming, for all sorts of reasons. And um, uh, over 15,000 species occur here, many of which occur nowhere else. As I said before, the the northern part is more tropical forest, it's less mon mountainous, so it's more easy to, more, more sub subject to, to being cleared. And um, that's what we're gonna talk about now. So um, here is a map that shows what the forest was originally, the yellow, and the little bit that's left, and these little green fragments, what was left uh, when the map was made around 2005. So it's been 15 years since then. 
a biodiversity hotspot. It has high species diversity, high endemism. That means high numbers of species that occur nowhere else so that if you cut down the forest they're in, they're gone. And therefore it's critically endangered because of high pressure for deforestation. Less than 5% of the original forests are remaining. And of the remaining forests, less than 5% is protected. So we have 5% of 5% is a very small number. The threats can be large scale industrial uh, agriculture as we see in this sugarcane plantation or small scale clearing farming and then you move on and clear another spot and let this grow back, and which is much less, uh, much less serious <coughs> remaining. Um, here, the forest is moister near the coast, and as you move inland, it becomes drier and usually that's less rainfall, but also it means that part of the year it doesn't rain. So you get these dry periods, which may be just a few weeks, and, but if you go farther inland, they can be, become uh, quite long. So here's uh, another student of mine, Daniel Piotto, standing at scale next to some huge tree. <clears throat> but also as you go inland, it gets drier, but also there are mountains here, as we saw in the very first slide. And as you go up, uh, the winds coming off the, the ocean hit the first series of hills and they will rain there. And those, those higher forests are moister. They tend to remain moist all the time. So you have more likely to have species that, that can't dry out like tree ferns. Just a look at some of the trees here, some of the species. Uh, Carina legalis, one of the huge trees in the forest, this particular tree, the up to the very first branch is 30 meters. And then other, other trees, this capris, uh, gentian, uh, uh, nematanthus, and harleodendron, a, a very unusual species, which is a legume with a radiosymmetric flower. And then moving a little farther inland, slightly drier conditions, we have Camadelesia, which is a tree that's huge, huge wide trunk, and it's like commonly a tree of, of dry forests. And the national tree of Brazil, the Brazil word of Pernambuco, <coughs> Cecilpinia, what was Cecilpinia, now called Brasilia echinata. And this is uh, a, bow, uh, a tree that's used by for all all fancy um, bows, uh, violin bows, are made from this wood. This area is also has two groups that are extremely diverse here: um, bamboos, as in Sucrea, and uh, the orange family, the Rutaceae, really diverse in this region for some reason. As you move farther inland, uh, where the dry periods are longer and the rainfall is less, the forests get more open and dry, and many giant bromeliads are found here, including this giant Ichmea species. And these forests are less diverse because they're, they're stressed by the drying, but there are many species that occur nowhere else. And then, as, as I said, if you go up to the tops of the mountains, <clears throat> you have tree ferns like Cyathea here that have to remain, remain moist all year round. Little epiphytic orchids, gentians, um, these areas can, are, are in many ways, they reflect the flora. They're similar to the flora that you find in the mountains uh, near Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. Now, how diverse are they? We decided a long time ago to determine how diverse one hectare of forest is. So it means we had to measure out the hectare, mark every tree over five centimeters in diameter, collect a voucher for every tree to identify, and then identify every tree. Now, just to get, for those of you who 
are familiar with the botanical garden here, a 500 meter transect that's 20 meters wide for one hectare <clears throat> would run from the fountain out in front of the museum building out to the parking lot beyond the, the entrance to the, to the garden at the visitor center. So and I think that's, and then you've got 20 yards wide that you're gonna collect all the trees in. Now, what is, what does that mean in, in terms of uh, trees and, and so on? We're using Jackson Pollock as a, an example of a forest. Uh, now, if he had used hundreds of colors, this would be reflect a tropical forest. And uh, our transect in this forest may come right here, right in the middle, because your transect is only going to sample part of that forest diversity. So if we're interested in the blue trees, they're rare in our transect, but they're really not that rare in the whole forest. But this is our snapshot. So if you wanted to get a really good sampling of the forest, you'd have to do lots and lots of hectares, but that's a lot of work because every tree has to be collected and measured and sampled. And that's for this transect was 2,500 trees. And then they all have to be identified at herbarium here at the New York Botanical Garden, but also the herbaria, local herbaria, which will have a better sample of the local flora. To our surprise, when we did this and came up with the numbers, we, for trees over five centimeters, we had 458 species of trees. And for trees over 10 centimeters, it was 276, which is huge because all of the Eastern US, based roughly uh, north of tropical Florida, has about 230 native species. <clears throat> My former student, Daniel Piotr, resurveyed the same Hector 18 years later. And you know, some trees had died, of course, others had come in, uh, but he was able to do that and he recalculated the biomass. It was virtually the same. It was a, it's a steady state forest. There's trees leave, trees come in, trees grow. But the other really cool thing is, whereas some trees were really fast and they covered up the tag that we had from 18 years earlier, others didn't grow at all. So they're just sitting there waiting for their chance. Now, the other thing is thinking about conservation. <clears throat> 2,500 trees, 458 species, uh, doing a mathematically, probably the forest has about 700 species. We only sampled about 65% in this one transect. Um, 160 species only found once in the transect. The most common ones weren't that common, 64 or 80 times out of 2,500 trees. And that means that if we wanted to conserve all the species in this forest, all the tree species, how big a forest would we need to be able to make sure we had a viable population, let's say 200 reproductive individuals of each species? We'd have to have a lot more than uh, one hectare because we had 160 species that only occurred once. Also, the, be, being forced to collect every tree means that we collected things that we would have overlooked before. And this, this survey enabled us to collect at least 13 species or new to science that have been described already. <clears throat> and that means if you're looking at this, this forest here, maybe these pink trees are ones with no names. Now I'm gonna move farther north now to the Guayribas Biological Reserve in Paraiba. I've spent a lot of time farther north than Bahia also. And this enabled me to work with students at Federal University of Pernambuco in Paraiba, <coughs> taking them into the forest and, uh, and working with them. So uh, they have very, very bright students. They uh, taught them to press plants. Here's Joe Mark pressing plants. Me, this student Alini, I'm going to come back to in a minute, but they found a lot of new species because you got a lot of eyes looking at these forests. And uh, 
one of really cool thing is that Sidnalini decided she was going to look for little tiny plants, saprophytes, and she found this little thing. This came up to me, Professor Thomas. What is this thing? I had no idea what it was. It turns out it's a species otherwise known from one locality in Mexico, and now it's known from a second in northeast Brazil. But you got to be looking really carefully because this is the size of the plant. <coughs> Conservation is really important. Our work in Bahia enabled us to, uh, with the help of a very important conservation organization locally, to get established the, the Serra do Condoru State Park, which is uh, 22,000 acres, a big park. But also uh, today we're working with the people at, at this conservation organization, Floresta Viva, to because we, we know where the rare species are, or we can we know where to look for them, we can track down populations of them and use those to, uh, in reforestation projects, to <coughs> help increase their, the numbers in, in the wild. Andrea Doxa here is sort of our symbol. A tree uh, is the, the rarest species in the world because it's known by this one tree pointed out by the blue arrow. And we're trying to, it, it produces seeds and we're replanting those out and we're gonna try and spread it out, but we've gotta find more individuals of it. And at the end, I wanted to talk about the dry forest in the Northeast. It's often overlooked when we think about the forest. And this is the Kaching or white forest and uh, very dry. But when it does rain, it can become beautiful. Uh, often overgrazed as we see in this picture in the lower right but in the areas where there are no growths that are grazing a lot of the ephemeral species are really cool and so uh, <clears throat> here we're looking at a, a rock outcrop that has seepage on it and i'm looking for a very rare sedge it's only been collected four times before and we found it rancospora aberrans so we've gone from sedges to the Atlantic forests and from the forests back to sedges. Thank you all very much. Wade, thank you so much. Um, we've had great comments and hellos in the chat all along from your collaborators and students. <laughs> so grateful for your work and uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us today. Oh, my uh, pleasure. <laughs> We do have questions. Hold on, let me uh, transition for folks who are unfamiliar with our format. Here we go. Um, so, apologies. Uh, so, now it's time for the Q&A. So audience members, um, go ahead and add your questions to the Q&A button if you haven't already. Um, you can also click um, to upvote other questions that you see that are similar to your own. And that way we can prioritize the ones that are most popular for everyone here. So um, we have some questions already. And with me for a minute, wait. Um, so folks have been asking a little bit about invasive species, um, sedges. Are there any um, sedges in this category that are invasive or that are um, impacted by invasive species in Brazil that you have studied? Uh, there are, there's one species of ring cosper that was, I was, I was, I've studied that is found in pastures and weedy areas as ring cosper ciliata. It has brack, white bracts, um, but invasive, I would, wouldn't go, I don't think it, it has, I don't think there are any ring cosperas that have are damaging to crops, for example. For, ex for example, there are a couple of cyperus species that are extremely uh, invasive, um, but rincospas, no. Thank you. Um, folks are interested uh, in links that may or may not exist between the Atlantic forest and the Amazon. Can you tell us a little bit about the floristic differences there between those regions, um, or if there are relationships <coughs> that exist between them? Uh, yeah, there are several. Um, hypothesized areas of connection because they have been connected clearly 
in the past. There have been phylo phylogenetic studies in various groups, plants and animals that show that they've been connected and either uh, a group has migrated north from the Atlantic forest to the Amazon and then they diversified and one clade of the Amazonian ones later came back to the Atlantic forest or vice versa. So uh, they have been connected and one, one of the hypo hypothesized routes is along the coast. Uh, another is along gallery forests. As it got moister, gallery forests would expand farther inland and, and rivers may connect up uh, from the Amazon coming south and, and rivers going in to the west from, from the uh, Atlantic forest. Um, so there's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of different scenarios. But despite those connections, there are still so many unique species and, and, and ecosystems. Yes. <coughs> for anyone. You have to remember the Atlantic forest, the whole length of it is the same length as going from uh, Canada north of Maine to Havana, Cuba. So it's really long. We would never think of those forests as being the same here. But because it's called the Atlantic forest, people have in their heads that it's the same thing, but it's really lots of different forests as you move north. Thank you. We have a question from Suzanne that was quite popular with our audience. Um, and I'll read the question. As a fan of, pop, of pollination, I especially love the sedges that attract insects. What sort of inflorescence visitors have you seen? And do the plants provide any reward like nectar for the insects? Okay, I should have brought that up. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, the reward is pollen. Um, so that's not as tasty to us as, as sugary nectar, but to a small insect, the protein and the lipids that are found in the pollen are maybe more important. Um, uh, and, um, what was the other part about it of the question was the first part was um, um, what insects have you seen oh the normal normally the most important pollinators uh, are bees hmm. and most important in the sense that they are the most efficient at transferring pollen from one plant to another but they also the most their most frequent visitors there are flies and beetles that that uh, that visit the flowers and consume whatever there is to consume on the flower. But flies will do some pollination, beetles less, because they don't move so much. And they, when they land on inflorescence, they tend to just consume it, you know. Um, but they can. Great. Um, folks were interested in, in particular species that have specific habitat ranges and that are endangered and threatened. You may have mentioned one or two um, in your talk. Um, are there any of these species that have a unique ecological role or interactions with insect species that we wanna be particularly aware of and concerned by? The relationship between species of Rhinchospora and species of insects <clears throat> have not been studied in any specific way. They, uh, the, in terms of pollination, uh, they're more generalists. They are open and their stamens are out there to be consumed. And anybody who can, can see them can land on them and consume pollen and then move to another plant. But habitat requirements that can be very specific. A lot of these species are very difficult to grow. Uh, Rincosper duquei, that weird one that was just short and has a white brax I showed, uh, occurs on white sand in black water, in areas where there are black water. So uh, it's like trying to grow a Venus flytrap. If you put regular water on it, you'll kill the plant because that water has too much, too many minerals in it and will, will kill that plant that can only grow in sterile water. <coughs> Uh, the other flashy Rincosa speciosa with the big white bracts grows in the Comprima pestre in areas where there's seepage water. So the, the roots are con constantly being bathed in, in this water that's seeping through. And if there's no seepage slope, you probably can't grow it. 
So there's very, very often very subtle uh, requirements. Thank you, Wade. Um, I want to give a shout out to our audience members who have been helping to answer questions in the Q and A. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, we've got some experts in the audience, which is always you a do. Good thing. I've, I've, <laughs> I I uh, made a point of inviting some experts to yeah. listen in. So, so feel free, audience members, to check the Q&A yourself and see some of the questions are already being answered there. I won't go through all of those because we want to push through as many as we can. Um, uh, quickly, wait, um, the Hector plot design with 500 meters by 20, was there a particular reason you chose that shape or orientation? Is that a standard um, way of measuring? The, the orientation is more or less random. We said we want to start here, because, but but we we uh, within within a, a range we wanted to be random so that we didn't so no one could accuse us. So we wanted to make sure we got this, <coughs> you know, this tree that was a meter in diameter. Make sure that's in our plot. No, we we uh, we uh, had a, a a random choice of of of, uh, of compass direction. But 500 meters lets you get some variation as you, as you move through the forest. Um, but it's, it's much easier to do than 1000 meters at 10, 10 meters wide. Um, and <clears throat> as you make as you make it more of a block, you're getting uh, more uniformity. So there is was some variance to probably up the diversity a little bit. Thank you. By using 500 meters. I see. Um, I think this is a, a great question and it might, you know, it's a complicated answer, I'm sure, but um, what direct actions are being taken um, by NYBG, by your um, collaborators in real time to try to mitigate the, the damage to these ecosystems? Um, halting habitat destruction, for example, and what alternative land uses um, can we propose uh, as an institution to mitigate or reduce habitat loss or other solutions that you know of that are also really important and relevant? Okay, this that's several questions I'll try and uh, the first one is as researchers at the Botanical Garden, we have the privilege of going to a lot of really interesting areas to do our collecting work. And it behooves us, I believe, to use the information we get from those trips to help stimulate local organizations to <coughs> conserve their habitat. We can't go there and say, we, the New York Botanical Garden, are going to conserve your habitat. Local people have to get interested and do it or it'll never happen. But as we found out from this high diversity study, the fact that the people in Southern Bay can say, our forests are, are super diverse, that became really important and was an excellent tool to take to the politicians to, to move them to set aside these 20,000 uh, acres that they, they set aside. Um, <clears throat> the knowledge of our local collaborators to say, we can, we can find these populations of rare tree species and help conserve those species. That's happening right now. And we can use that when local reforestation. So they're, they're growing out these Andrea Noxa seedlings and, and 30 other tree species seedlings. And they're taking them to local farmers who have their own forest reserves, many of which are beat up, and many of them want to restore them, they can put these rare species in there. So those are those are things that, that we can do. We can help the local local groups do that, but we have to work with the locals. So um, reforestation is, you know, that's 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 not what I do, but I think it's something we can help with. We can, we can help raise, help them raise money. Thank you. Wait, I think that's a great answer. Um, we're starting to run out of time. As you know, there are so many great questions. I'll ask one more that's gotten a lot of attention um, from Alan. 
uh, it generally seems that understory plants are ignored in many tropical diversity studies. Um, quote, <coughs> ground trash, as Al Gentry used to call them. Have any studies in the Atlantic forest included herbaceous and understory shrubs? And if so, are diversity measures similar to the arborescent or tree vegetation? Really good question. And I can't answer it very well other than being a sedge biologist working in on the forest trees, I was always looking down low too. Uh, and I think the forest is extremely diverse. If the trees are diverse, other things are likely to be diverse too, but uh, not all groups, for instance, there's just enough dry period in the, in the Atlantic forest that you're not gonna get a real high diversity of orchids as you would in the Andes where you know, it's much wetter and it's wet all year round. <clears throat> but I think, I think there, there's probably a very high correlation between overall herbaceous diversity and tree diversity, but that remains to be uh, rain, remains to be studied by someone else. I mean, th it took three months of field work to do that hectare. So uh, if you're going to another three months to do the, the herbaceous plants, uh, which are much harder to study in some ways because they're, they're, they're not big woody thing. You've got this one little little thing you've got you're going to sample that and then you've you've removed the plant from existence you know um, you can't take a voucher specimen of it and have it still be there so also less than five percent of the trees were fertile at any one time in the transect the same thing things going to be true for the herbaceous plants so in some ways, you need to have, you have a lot of specialists going through that know their group, you know, fertile or infertile. Sounds like there's a, a, a mixture of logistic, time constraint, different kinds of challenges, but there's yes. ample opportunity out there. There's, for, there's uh, so much to do. Yeah. yeah, for botanists, which is, I think, one of our goals with these talks is, is to demonstrate. Think of that Lacandonia that yeah. is, it, it occurs between Northeast Brazil and, and in Mexico, it's there, but someone has to be looking at the right place at the right time to see it. Well, I think that's a great place to, to lead off, Wade. Um, thank you so much. Uh, again, we're, we're out of time, but thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Charlie, for organizing this. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone in our audience uh, for joining today's presentation. You've been fantastic. Um, if you missed any part of this event or wish to watch it again, like I said, this uh, presentation has been recorded and it will be shared on the NYBG Lecture Library. So we hope you'll join us for future science conservation and humanities lectures in the future from the New York Botanical Garden. And for those who haven't already registered for a mailing list, I'm going to put a link in the chat in just a moment. So until next time, please stay well, stay green, and take care, everyone. <laughs>